I'm so excited about this. Uh, we've never done it before, and so this is the first time we're going to do this, and so I'm really excited to announce this. Um, I'm just so proud and so blessed to be part of this church. This church is a very generous church, very generous. And so uh, because of your obedience to God bringing the tithes and offerings into his church, uh, God has blessed this church tremendously. And so we don't take that lightly. The board has, has come to God and said, God, uh, how do you want us to, uh, to really manage the resources and the, the things that you've blessed the church with? And so we came to God and, and the board have decided that we are going to do something special. And uh, December 10th is a special day for all of us. So what we're going to do is within the Assemblies of God, which is our denomination, there are about 5,000 ministries, leaders, uh, pastors, and ministers, a lot. And some of these pastors are struggling, which means that they are in a rural area, uh, and just a, trying to obey the call of God. But there's this marriage, uh, struggling. And so what if, think about this, what if, we would invite this pastor and his family, and that we would just bless them with their needs. What if they would come here, and that we would just bless them? We were actually receiving of them many years ago, uh, about 17 years ago, believe it or not, being a pastor of this church for 17 years, Annalise and I, it was just out of obedience while we came to Lima. The church, there was absolutely no promise of any income. Uh, when we took over this church. And having two children, you didn't have to really step, you really got to believe God and you got to have a strong faith. And that's all we had. We came here out of obedience. And do you know that the first uh, paycheck that we got was 50 bucks a month? With two children. But I just want to tell you, God was so incredible for providing for our needs. One of them is that there was a church in Sacramento, and this church um, called us out of the blue the first year. And they invited us to Sacramento, and they actually came here to kind of just look, we're looking around, and they wanted to go to our house. And we're like, uh, okay. And so they went to the house, and they were just kind of looking around. We didn't know what was going on. And so they made a list of things that we didn't have. Well, we didn't have furniture. We didn't have a room. Everything were borrowed. Even our own bed, we didn't even have it. Had our own bed. And so they made a list. And so when we went to Sacramento the first year, when we obeyed God, guess what? They bought us a bed. They bought us bed, our own bed, and children. We, we had two children. They got a new bed, a fridge. We didn't have a fridge. <laughs> you know, we, what was that? Christine was born, so so three. Imagine that. Wow. Amen. And then we had furniture and things like that. We were just blown away. We were so encouraged. You know why? Because God told us, I'm going to take care of you. Okay. And so can you imagine that now we're in a position to do that? So we are going to invite this pastor. We got one. Uh, Sam Inman is his name. And he pastors in Boonville, California. Don't ask me where that is. I have no... Did you know Woodville? Woodville? <laughs> he's five and a half hours away from here. Really? So he's coming from there. And so he's got four children and one foster child. I'm really excited about this. Uh, so uh, December 10th is a special day for us. They're going to come here, and we're just going to bless them. I'm just so excited about this and really encourage, them, encourage him and the family that God is faithful even though you're in Boonville, California, uh, you know, God sees you. God honors your obedience. And so can you just imagine for us to be able to do that? So it's going to happen during our one world, between our first service and second service. And so during our one world, we're just going to bless this family. I'm really excited about this. And so uh, you, got, you want to be there for that. Okay. So awesome. So that's something exciting for me to share with you. Awesome. So... This morning, um, we are going to continue this journey of going deeper, going deeper. 
How many of you have enjoyed this journey with me? This is just an awesome journey. Uh, I just love the fact that we get to go deeper with them. You get to. Uh, you don't reach a point to where I can't go deeper anymore. No. It really, it's your desire, my desire. And just to have an attitude, I want to go deeper with God. And God will honor that. And so, what we're going to talk about is part of going deeper is worship. You might say worship. Well, yeah, worship. And so we're going to talk about true worship this morning. True worship. Why true worship is part of going deeper with God. There was a, a king by the name of Canute. King Canute he was once ruler of England. And uh, the members of his court were continually full of flattery with words, almost a point of worshiping him. You are the greatest man that ever lived. You are the most powerful king of all. Your Highness, there is nothing you cannot do. Nothing in this world dares disobey you. So the king was a wise man, and he grew tired of such foolish words. One day, as he was walking by the seashore, the king decided to teach them a lesson. So, you say, I'm the greatest man in the world, right? And he quickly said, O king, there has never been anyone as mighty as you, and there never be anyone so great ever again. And you say, all things obey me, right? And they said, yes, sir. The world bows before you and gives you honor. Hmm, I see. Well, if that's the case, bring me my chair and place it down by the water. So the servants quickly carry the king's royal chair over the sands. At his direction, they placed the chair right at the water's edge. The king sat down and looked out at the ocean. And he said, I notice the tide is coming towards me. Do you think it will stop if I give the command? Give the order, O great king, and it will obey, cried his entourage. Then the king gave the command, See, I command you to come no further. Do not dare touch my feet. Well, he waited a moment, and a wave rushed up the sand and lapped at his feet. How dare you, the king shouted. Ocean, turn back now. I have ordered you to retreat before me now, and you must obey. Go back. He came another way, laughing at, it, at the king's feet. The king remained on his throne throughout the day, screaming at the waves to stop. Yet the water kept coming, until the seat of the throne was covered with water. Finally, the king turned to his entourage and said, Well, it seems I do not have quite so much power as you would have believed. Perhaps now you will remember that there is only one king who is all-powerful, the God of the universe, the God who created all things. And it is he who rules the sea and holds the ocean in the hollow of his hand. I suggest you reserve your worship for this God. Hallelujah. Worship is a pretty interesting word. When you hear the word worship, we somehow connect worship with a slow song. We somehow connect worship with bowing down or lifting up our hands or kneeling down. We somehow connect worship with that. Isn't it? That's, that's pretty interesting. But I wonder if real worship, if true worship is any of that. Now, those are expressions of worship. We do it every Sunday. But I wonder if they are to worship. Well, we're going to see. The first appearance of the word worship is found in the book of Genesis. Believe it or not, chapter 22. And this is a story about Abraham being tested by God to sacrifice his one and only son, Isaac. And so let's look at it real quick. In verse 22, uh, verse, chapter 22, verse 1, sometime later, God 
tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey. Okay, look at this. While I and the boy go over there, we will what? Come on, help me out. We will worship. worship, and then we will come back to you. So verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, uh, Father? <laughs> uh, he answered, Yes, my son. Uh, the fire and the wood are here. Uh, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood in it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a, a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horn. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations of earth will be blessed, because you have, come on, help me out, you have worship. obeyed me. The question is then, what is worship? Obedience. We're going to get there. Uh, thanks. We should wrap it up. You just gave the answer. <laughs> Typically, when we hear the word worship, again, somehow we think of slow song or, you know, lifting up our hands and things like that. Now, when we heard uh, in Genesis 22, 5, that Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey, I and a boy will go over there and worship. I wonder if Abraham was like, uh, son, well, let's, uh, we're going to go over there and worship, so... Uh, you bring the heavy stuff, you bring the keyboard, and I'm going to bring the guitar and the bass, okay? And then you're going to, that's kind of a lot. So you bring the drums with you, we're going to go up there and worship him. Is that what it says? It has nothing to do with singing a slow song or bringing any word of, you know, worship tools like this we use that we say and that we call worship. It seems like to me that, uh, that this idea of worship, what you worship, has something to do with three things in this passage, and that's what we're going to look at. Because it seems like to me, friends, that the, our idea of worship is not quite biblical. And so today my goal is to teach us what really the Bible says about true worship. True worship, it seems like to me, has something to do with surrender. True worship has something to do with surrender. In Genesis 1, 1, 3, it tells us this. After this, things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering and one of the mountains of which I, said, I shall tell you. So then listen to this. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and so... 
two young men with him and his son Isaac. It seems like to me that true worship is connected to surrender. I don't know about you, but I thought about this many, many times I, when I used to read this uh, passage. Can you just imagine God coming up to you and saying, uh, or saying to me specifically, uh, Son, I want you to take Nathan and sacrifice him. Uh, we would have a problem. Because, uh, okay, wait, wait, wait. Uh, what, what, what did you say? You want me... What? So it seems like to me that this idea of surrender, a lot of times, it just doesn't make sense. So it seems like to me that it is vital and it's important if you want to go deeper with God. Because, friends, that is true worship. It's to get to a place of surrender. And for Abraham, he needed to surrender to God in order to experience true worship and go deeper with him. Now look at this. The surrender deal of Abraham with God was this. It was God's will and not Abraham's. It was, it was basically what God desires and wants, not what he desired or wanted. It was God's purpose and not Abraham's. Are you following me? And so that is this idea of, of surrender. And, 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 and this, here's the thing. I, went, I came to a point in my life when I got saved that I needed to surrender. A lot. Why is that? Because Angela wants to be in control. Am I the only one that wants to be in control here? And God is just saying, surrender, son, surrender, daughter. Come on. You holy people. <laughs> just not struggling with this. Awesome. You're so awesome. So now, here's the thing. Abraham had to come to a place of surrender in order to experience your worship of God. Now, then the second thing that I found here is that when we come to a place of surrender, true worship is also this, is sacrifice. So surrender and sacrifice. It's the second thing. Look at this. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And then the angel of the Lord showed up, right? No, no, no. Don't kill your son. Now I know that you fear God. Now, I don't know about you. Going back to what I said, God saying to me, he sacrificed uh, your son Nathan, and I would probably respond, how, how quick do you want me to do this, God? No, I'm just kidding. So, but anyway, can you just imagine God just saying to me, sacrifice your one and only son, Isaac? And I would come up to Annalisa and say, uh, uh, God spoke to me, and uh, I, I think God said that he wants me to go to Mount Rose and sacrifice Nathan. Can you just imagine how outrageous would that be? And she would be like, what? Are you out of your mind? If God would ask you. Right? But isn't it interesting that if God would dare ask us to sacrifice some things that we love? So the question is, who's your Isaac? Who's your Isaac in your life? Is, is, is your Isaac somehow the relationship that you value more than God? Is your Isaac somehow, is this money, business, success, whatever, your job? Is that your Isaac that you love more than God? That you value more than God? Is it your family, your marriage? Is it perhaps the pornography that you're struggling with, or maybe this addiction, or alcohol, and drugs? that you value more than God. Who is your Isaac that you need to sacrifice today? For some of us, for me as a pastor, is it maybe that my Isaac is my ministry? If I'm not careful, it could be. For some of you that are involved in ministries, it could be. Is your Isaac, maybe, 
that this idea of blessings, because you have been blessed so incredibly and so much, that that's your, I think that you value that more than anything, more than God. That could be honest. You cannot take possessions of any of these things. You're not meant to. God is the owner of all of these things, and he belongs to him. And so the question is, who's your Isaac? Do you need to sacrifice today? Many years ago, um, close to 20 years ago, I was working at this one company, and uh, I was making a lot of money. I was make, I was climbing up the ladder. I was one of those guys that are just determined. And just, I do well most, most, you know, for the most part. I was making a lot of money, and the company was sending me to school for free. And I was just enjoying life. And then I get to know Jesus. And Jesus says, son, I want you to surrender. I was like, God, you want me to sur what? surrender all of this? Yes, son. Because that's your Isaac. And I want you to go to Sacramento and go to school. You mean you want me to quit all of this in my future? And you just want me to move to Sacramento and go to college to become a pastor? Yes, son. And so out of obedience, because I was willing to kill my Isaac to obey God, not long after that, I quit my job and I went to Sacramento to obey God. And so, I just want to tell you this. It's so amazing. For the last 17 years, I stand before you. And I'm so glad that I surrendered my eyes. And prior to that, of coming to know Jesus, I, I was in two relationships. Yeah, I know, I, I was a mess. I was living in with a girl, and then I had this girl that I wanted to marry. I was a mess. Then I come to know Jesus, and God says to me, surrender your Isaac. You mean this relationship shifts? And God said yes. But I wanted to surrender your Isaac. I came to a point, after, not long after that, I surrendered my eyesights to them. And because I did that, then Annalisa came and just asked me to marry her. <laughs> <laughs> and just, she wanted me so bad, I said, I'd be praying for you. And I was <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get it afterwards. <laughs> That's what I mean, like. But if it wasn't for my willingness to surrender Isaac, my personal Isaac, there's no way in the world that I would be here today. There's no way in the world that I would have met an incredible woman of God who just loves God deeply. He loves me with all of my brokenness. And here's the thing. Our relationship right now uh, is not perfect. I was perfect, and I got married to her, then it became so perfect that all of us. Anyway, uh, so we, but we do have a very healthy relationship. A very healthy relationship. You know why it's so healthy? It's because Jesus is at the center of this marriage. And that basically, I look at her and say, God, just, I'm in trouble, just give me that yeah, yeah, I love you. And so, uh, she would always, she, she does this a lot. She would just pray to God, God, just give me the eyes to see Angela the way you see her. And I'm like, talking to me? <laughs> You don't need to have God to see me the way. No, I'm just kidding. But, but that's what she prays every day. That, that she would see me the way God sees me. That I would see her the way God sees her. 
Because if I see her the way God sees her, guess what? She's going to be the most valuable thing that God has given me. That I would value her so much, and vice versa. Are you with me? Yes. And so it seems like to me the part of to worship to God and going deeper is not only your willingness to surrender, but also sacrificing some things. I had to surrender and sacrifice my Isaac. What about you? Who do you need to sacrifice today? Who's your Isaac? And thirdly, it seems like to me that your worship is this. It's also obedience. Also obedience. God says to Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering as on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham, guess what? Rose early in the morning. Now, I don't know about you, but I guarantee you that Abraham had to have a conversation with God. God, really? This is a promised son you've given me. I mean, you don't even know. You know how much I love this boy, and you want me to do what? And isn't it, would you not agree that this is something so outrageous? I mean, for God to ask something that you love so dearly and to sacrifice it and just to end his, whatever, his life? But then, somehow there's this supernatural peace that came over Abraham. And when God spoke, it just didn't make sense. It was just outrageous. And somehow this peace that he had was to obey God because God was trustworthy. I want to tell you today, God might ask you to do something so outrageous, so, something crazy, just doesn't make sense. But I want to tell you, the peace of God, you will have it. But when you step out of faith and trust God, I want to tell you that you, I guarantee you, are going to go deeper and experience what true worship is all about. Are you with me? Amen. And so I just want to let you know, friends, in the book of Romans chapter 12, beginning from verse 1 to Paul said, So dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let him be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will, he will find acceptable. This is surely the way, look at this, surely the way to what? Worship him. Worship him? Are you serious? Mm -hmm. That this is really true? Worship is a life of obedience? A life of surrender? A life of, of, of sacrifice? Yes. That is what true worship is all about. It has nothing to do with the slow song or lifting up our hands. True worship has a lot to do with our willingness to surrender and to sacrifice and to obey God. Are you with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Look here, you can never go wrong by obeying God, but many things can go wrong in disobeying Him. Amen. Would you agree? Amen. The common, common law of Christians is something like this. They want the benefits of living with Jesus and getting His blessings without making a commitment to obey. But do you remember what James said in chapter 1? Just don't listen to God's word, but you must do what it says. Right? You must do what it says. And that's why when people say to me, Angelo, knowledge is power, I say, uh, no. Knowledge is not power. Because if knowledge is power, then, all of, then you're going to have all these people that are knowledgeable with the word of God, obeying and living for Christ. But they're not. So is it possible that knowledge is not power? Yes, knowledge with application is power. Just don't, do, just don't listen to the word, but do what it says. Application, right? Because there's power in applying the word of God in your life. Are you with me? Look at what Jesus said in chapter, uh, chapter 14 in the book of John, verse 21. The one who loves me will do the things I have commanded. Right? If you love me, Jesus said that you will obey my commands. Right? If I really say I love Jesus, I gotta look at my life. 
do I truly love Jesus? Because I will be able to tell. If I'm living a life of surrender, and I'm willing to sacrifice my Isaac, whatever that is, and if I'm willing to live a life of obedience, I want to tell you that is true worship to God. It is our true worship to Him. And, and that is what is going to take us deeper with Him. I don't know about you, but I really want to go deeper with my God. And I know you do. But I want to tell you, the singing and all this stuff will not take you there. Prayer will not take you there. Although these are important. Right? Reading the Word of God is important, but I want to tell you, it's the Holy Spirit. We talked about that the Holy Spirit leads us to there, to going deeper. It's not by reading the Word of Prayer, or all, although they are important, but I want to tell you, without the Holy Spirit, you, can go, you cannot go deeper. And that's why we rely on the Holy Spirit. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us to go deeper. But I want to tell you, He cannot take you deeper without you willing to surrender. Without you willing to sacrifice your Isaac. Without you willing to obey Him. Amen. Are you following me? Yeah. So it is really the Holy Spirit in me. Right? The Holy Spirit in me. The Holy Spirit has to take me deeper. But He cannot take you deeper unless you're willing. I love what John Bevere said. Worship isn't just a slow song on Sunday. It's obedience on Monday. Mommy said, Mommy said. I don't know about you. Mommy said. But I love to worship God. And I just love to express my love for God. Earlier, that was an incredible time of worship. Man, I at both services, it doesn't get old. Man, I would just... It, it just in tears, just loving God. But then I wondered, though, if I'm living a life of disobedience and, and I'm willing to surrender, just not willing to surrender to Him, and I'm not willing to sacrifice my Isaac, I wonder my, what my songs would be like to Him. It's probably a stench, right? Brother Joey, uh, we had a problem last week uh, in that kitchen, and we have, somehow, we have this little container that I don't understand all the plumbing stuff, but we have this container, and it's supposed to, so the thing is, all the articles of articles are supposed to go down there. And so then, all of a sudden, uh, they were kind of panicking there because now the sink's not working and it's flooding the kitchen and all that. And so, they, so Brother Joey was called to solve this problem. And so he basically went there and opened it up and lo and behold, what were inside that container was just nasty, nasty stuff that, that had been there for probably for about four years. He opened this thing up and he stunk the whole kitchen and the whole back. And then he gave me an invitation. He said, uh, Pastor, you want to come here and just look at this thing? And it was an invitation, so I'm thinking, okay, should I respond should I not? And somehow it was an invitation, so I responded. And so I went there, and to see this thing, I'm telling you, why did I respond to his invitation to see this thing? And so it was the nastiest thing. And it was just this, this smell is so bad. And then he decided to go to Brother Jake's front yard and just poured all that thing in front of his yard. And so that was that was a great job, Brother Joe. I'm just kidding. I'm not even doing that. So anyway, and so it was just so bad. But then I wonder, though, if my life is like that. That, man, I sing songs. I lift up my hands. And man, I live a life of disobedience. I'm not willing to sacrifice my Isaac. No, no, no. And I'm not willing to obey him. I wonder what kind of aroma is going up to God. Because I want you to know that God's desire is for all of us to bring a great aroma to him. Thank you. 
And it's not how great you would sing and how wonderful you could play the guitar and how amazing you could kneel down and lift up your hands in so great a voice. But it all comes down here, the heart of your At the end of the day, is your heart and mind. So let me just end with that. Your heart, my heart. Am I an incredible aroma to God or am I a fish to God? I don't want to, I refuse to be a bad aroma to God. So I just want to encourage you today to really think about and consider your heart. Where is my heart today? Where, where does it stand? So would, would you just close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment?